if everyone could go on mute, that would be great. Uh, we'll have, like I said, we'll have a question and answer portion later where you could unmute when you want to ask a question. Um, first of all, just want to thank everybody for coming on. Um, now it's our partnership between Redland Strategies and Atlantic Partners. Uh, we're extremely lucky to be able to have one of the world's most renowned uh, disaster planning experts with us today, uh, Mr. Michael Balboni. Uh, very, it, this is an honor for us. Um, first of all, for those of you who don't know Michael, uh, he, was a, he was a former New York State Senator during 9-11, uh, first chairman of the, of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, uh, wrote nearly all the uh, laws after 9-11 for New York. Um, 2007, he became the Deputy Secretary for Public Safety and Homeland Security, managed over 63,000 employees. Um, and created a lot of programs in New York, such as like New York Alerts. Anybody that's a New Yorker like me knows. Um, and, you know, handled a lot of, uh, of the, pre the presidential transitions. So he's been all over the place. Uh, but his main objective, our main objective here is to expose gaps um, in training in companies to prepare for disaster. Uh, cybersecurity attacks, breaches, hacks. Um, a lot of some of our, you know, the banks that we work with are in the South, things that happen with hurricanes, storms, um, and God forbid, active shooters in buildings or anything like that. Um, so we have, we are so fortunate to have someone. I've met Michael a few times. We've had a lot of great conversations. Um, you are getting this right from the person who not just talks about it, but has been there on the ground floor, knows this area, is an expert. Um, and it is our pleasure to, to introduce him to you. I believe we have a, a clip real quick first. Well, it has been six days since cyber attacks forced Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago offline. All phone, email, and electronic systems are now shut down as part of the hospital's cyber attack protocol. Now, this also leaves the care of hundreds of thousands of patients in jeopardy and families unable to reach pediatricians or access online medical records. Even surgeries put on hold as staff work with experts and law enforcement. We welcome now Michael Balboni, former New York State Homeland Security Advisor to weigh in. Michael, great to have you. Good to be here. So Lurie officials last week said on social media that they were investigating a, quote, cybersecurity matter. Uh, with the help of experts and law enforcement, they're doing this in tandem. So it's been six days, essentially no comment on the situation at all. What are the limited details of this case and the timeline tell you about what could be happening behind the scenes? Sure. So people might wonder why go after a, a hospital, particularly a children's hospital, because frankly, the data that is in these hospitals is incredibly sensitive. And the fact that it's a children's hospital, in fact, one of the largest in, in the Midwest, treats about 239,000 children a year, provides a special cruelty when you consider the parents wondering about the data that their children have. Now, the information we have out of the hospital doesn't indicate that any of the data that is in the records has been in fact taken. What they have found is that they have some digital access, but they're unable to use emails and schedule appointments, things like that. If that is the extent to which this attack happens, well, they should be able to recover or at least get to a workaround, as they say. However, typically what happens in these types of events, the bad guys get in, they do some surveillance, they find out where the sensitive data is, and they either encrypt it or they steal it. And one is called you know, the ransomware attack, where essentially you go and you, you take the data, you encrypt it, and then you say, you want the data back? Well, then pay us. But the other aspect of it is that they say, you know what? We're going to reveal what the data is and therefore pay us so we don't reveal it. And, of course, the third is they steal the data and then they sell it on the dark web. So what's really interesting here is to see over the next couple of days how they're going to get back to some type of normal operations. So uh, thank you all for joining. I did. I heard the banter back and forth uh, with Monroe and uh, all of you, and I felt like I was in the, the backyard listening to a bunch of friends kind of get together and talk. And that's a, that's a fantastic place, a fantastic venue to talk about these things. Um, you don't need to be this formal. I know that I've got the flags in the back, and that's, that's I'm a recovering politician, so sometimes I 
I tend to, I have these at my home as well, just kidding. Um, so I, I, I wanna thank all of you for joining, but I also wanna keep this as a conversation rather than by just spilling the stuff that's out there. We played that clip only as a way to kind of show that uh, I, I enjoy talking to the media, but that takes a lot of training. You know, I, I did uh, Fox Business News this morning and uh, I was on set for, for three hours and you kind of get hit with all sorts of different issues. And what it reminds me of is if, if you don't take the time to plan, if you don't take the time to actually think through what the response is going to be, well, that, that's, that's part of the challenge. So one of the things that uh, we want to talk about here is the ability to plan for something that you don't know is going to happen. And I have had the opportunity to work with a bunch of different places uh, and, and really work with the crowd that maybe didn't think about this beforehand. So next slide, please. So here are just some of the companies. Uh, you know, and, and these, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're familiar to most of you, but uh, maybe the, the funny, the, the middle one is the biggest fintech company that nobody's ever heard of. It used to be uh, First Data, and then they merged with Fiserv. They are a, um, a Fortune 100 company, and they literally have offices around the world. I've gotten a chance to travel to many of those places around the world, like Singapore and India. And, and we've done these risk assessments, and we've done this training. And what's really interesting about this fintech across the globe and versus Beth Page Federal Credit Union, which is one of the biggest thrifts in the, in the country, is that they have very similar concerns from a financial perspective. You know, both have constituencies that will not tolerate the system going down for very long. And it has to do so much about confidence. And there's a, a rule I learned in government. If you don't tell people what you're doing, and if you don't take the steps to plan, then people are going to think you're not doing and you're not prepared. So th that's really one of the things that uh, that this whole process drives. And then for the MTA, I got a chance this morning to talk to a, a, a captain who heads up the counterterrorism for the Transit Bureau and NYPD. And we were talking about this upcoming, we have a uh, active shooter training tabletop exercise on April 2nd at Grand Central. And what we talked about was that so often, even though you may be a hardened police officer, if you don't know the person next to you, if you haven't learned some of the lessons in terms of actual response, and if you don't know what to expect in terms of other, what other people do, then you're just simply not prepared. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, speaking of the MTA, back in the beginning of 2023, uh, the head of the MTA, Jano Lieber, asked me to do a tabletop exercise on two aspects, a active shooter and also a, a, a leave behind bag with a possible explosive device. So we did this. It was a, basically a four and a half hour exercise. And to his credit, Jano Lieber came and stayed for the entire exercise. But what happened later? Unfortunately, Three months later, there was, in fact, almost the exact same scenario that happened in real life in one of the subway stations. And this is what Newsday had to say about the efforts of the MTA. The Minton they're referring to is a former NBC reporter, Tim Minton, and he is now the public information officer for the MTA. One of the things I want to point out is that that phrase, collegial experience, because that's something that, that's an ancillary benefit you get from putting people in a room who have to work together. Next slide, please. So this is what we do. This is the, the uh, methodology that we try to work with. And you know, the first thing is we sit and we listen to what, how do you run your business? What are your pain points? What are the things if they happened, your business would stop and maybe not even recover? And then we talk about, so what does your industry require from you? What are the mandates? What's, what are the regulations? What are the guidances? And that last sentence is really important. What are the general best practices for your company in this industry? This next uh, uh, chart, we basically put together a, uh, an organization template of what, what it looks like in terms of your response to a uh, crisis. Who would be in charge? Who'd be making decisions? What would be the communication route for information, which is 
always incredibly important in any type of, of uh, situation. And then, of course, you know, this, this, this fourth uh, box here, this fourth bullet, this is really important and one of the hardest things to do. So who are the relevant stakeholders? Who should be in the room? As I mentioned with Jan Oliva, the head of the MTA, having buy-in from the top, absolutely essential. People will show up if they know their boss is there and they'll take things seriously. Even if they see the value, they'll get more into it if they know that the person who they basically report to is also invested. And then the last piece, so, you know, communication, data centers, cloud, these are all incredibly important, not just in terms of a cyber attack, but frankly, in terms of any type of issue that could affect your critical infrastructure, your technology infrastructure. Next slide, please. So these are the benefits of getting together through an exercise. You know, engagement. One of the things that I've learned, whether it's, again, it's in India, or I was just, I was just in Mexico City over the weekend uh, doing a tabletop exercise down there. One of the great things is engagement that you know, people, particularly in this line of, of work that we have now, whether it's distributed, that you're part working from home or you're working in the office, you, know, you have your head down and you're, you're doing your job. And, and very often you don't get a chance to take your eyes up and look at the horizon and say, okay, so what could happen? So this gives you an opportunity to do that. Second is, is the, this collaboration. Because oftentimes I've seen this a lot. The person sitting next to you has a skill set you didn't even know existed. You know, and, and they can bring something to the table that's outside of what they normally do in the business, which is just just a it's a great asset recognition opportunity. And the last, you know, the problem solving. I think you all know since you're since you've led organizations that one of the hardest things to do is put people in a room and begin to solve problems. If people walk into the room, they've got so many different things, whether it's, you know, they've had a bad day, they're feeling a lot of pressure, they, they have this, uh, maybe they're, they have a lot of um, ego, you know, which I know coming from the political world, that's always a problem. And so they get together and they begin to solve problems. And you can't solve a problem if you haven't identified it and then talk, to, talk through who would be the person who would bring to the table, how would you evaluate what the problems are? And what we do, by the way, is we put out a scenario. We say, so let's solve this. And we make it a non-judgment environment. We don't, there are no wrong answers. In fact, it's really important to have answers that people don't necessarily agree with and have the ability to talk to each other. To say, you know what, I wouldn't do it that way. Or would you, have we ever thought of doing it this way? And we try to, we don't try, we facilitate that discussion. Next, next slide, please. So here's really how we do this. And, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, it's, the slide indicated beforehand that we take a look at what is currently there. We then design a scenario to test what your plans or response are or what your pain points are. And then we, afterwards, we run an after action report that basically says, okay, we identified this gap. It came out in the tabletop and we think you finished it. We didn't think you finished it. And then there's always this, let's, design a continuous improvement model. Because as we talk about, you know, preparedness is not a destination, it's a journey. It takes time, it evolves, if you pay attention. Next slide, please. So I wanna take this moment and, and thank Monroe Gang and Arthur for uh, their partnership in this. You know, it's, it's obviously from Monroe's discussion with everybody beforehand in the, in the backyard barbecue setting that we have here. You know, this is a great opportunity to talk to people who I wouldn't necessarily get a chance to meet. And so I really appreciate your time and attendance, but but let's now kind of open it to make it not this, you know, one-sided uh, discussion, but more of a, a, of a conversation. Arthur? Hey, so Michael, first thing, like who from an organization needs to be, um, you know, engaged to make this a, a whole successful process? So typically it's the person who is, dealing with the risk of an organization. So it's your, it's your chief risk officer. It's the, it's the uh, emergency response officer. It's the person who, uh, you know, the manager of, of this particular building, the site. Uh, but it's also the person who runs the show. You know, the highest that you can go up in, in the 
leadership chain and have somebody say, yep, this is worth our time because it's going to take some time out of your day, at the very least. This is worth our efforts because you're going to have to work with a company like ours to kind of go through where you are currently and where you need to be. And also, you know, the, the you need to have someone who can articulate and be a champion for the value proposition of stopping in the middle of your workday and doing this. And, and so, you know, again, I've done this all around the world. And sometimes when you go in it, they say, what are we doing this for? And then when we finish, they say, ah, I know why we're doing this. Yeah, the other the other thing that I would really, you know, that I always wanted to ask is, um, you know, depending on the size of the organization and things like that, let's say, you know, one of the hospital groups or something, you know, how long would this process actually take from end to end, basically, for someone like that? So it's a great definitive answer. It depends. Uh, you know, it depends upon really the size of the organization. It depends upon what the organization wants to test. It depends upon how experienced the organization is with this type of a process. You know, do they have an audit function that they have to respond to every year? Um, do, do they have, what are the complex processes that they want to take a look at? So for example, you know, if you're a production facility, you, you produce widgets. Well, you know, if, if a hurricane, a tornado, a flood, these are really going to be impactful to you. Whereas if you really work with financial and technologies or even in healthcare, a cyber breach would be incredibly impactful and IT outage would be impactful. And so it depends upon what the organization wants to look at. It depends upon how large the organization is. We helped to develop the emergency response plan for Northwell Health. As I believe everybody probably is aware of their, I think they're the, the sixth or seventh largest healthcare organization in the country and the largest in New York state. And, and we had to work, we worked for months on that. We, I think there was a almost a, you know, seven, eight month engagement, but we went through all of their plans and we benchmarked then them. And then we basically got them into a, a testing mode. So it really depends, but it doesn't have to take, you know, from soup to nuts, it could probably take a couple months, maybe, or even less it depends upon also the timetable. How much time do you have? You tell us, you know, rock and roll, get moving. We'll do that. Great. I, I got a question. One of the, uh, the um, I've worked for some of the world's largest banks, <clears throat> and they've had, um, you know, they've had these kind of practices in, in, in place. Um, but one of the, uh, the smaller companies I worked for, a medium size company, forty-two billion in assets. Um, struggled mightily with the idea of what would they do in a ransomware attack mm -hmm. so you know for example they had gone through you know the uh, the physical threat you know things the denial of service and you know sort of the typical technological attacks that that you would see but when it came to um the, the whole question of ransomware they had far fewer answers to the question of when would they pay the money and when wouldn't they? Yeah. And, and they had a real, real difficulty kind of putting a, what, what, a decision tree or a flow chart together, right. uh, you, you know, to decide when do you actually pay the money? So I'm just curious if you've, you've had, uh, you know, what, what your experiences have been in that regard and, and uh, you know, how you advise clients, you know, in, in that, in that regard. So Steve, I really appreciate you you uh, mentioning that, and I also like your perspective. Forty two billion in assets is a, is a small company, or not that large company. Wow, we uh, you must really work with the the, the big guys. Um, but I, I've actually worked with it through three breaches. I think that's one of the uh, differentiations Redland Strategies brings to this conversation. I uh, worked with uh, uh, Beth Page when they had a breach, and this was a long time ago. Worked with a security guard company, and then I helped lead the response to the ransomware attack in Suffolk County. And a lot of lessons I've learned on these things. The first is, uh, to your point, you know, a lot of people like deer in the headlights when this thing happens. In fact, we did a, a tabletop exercise in India uh, with a, a financial uh, organization, financial uh, division of, of Pfizer. And our first scenario was they can't log on. That engendered a half an hour discussion as to what these folks would do because they can't log on. So to your point, a lot of folks are just not prepared mentally 
and they haven't worked through this. So if they went and they took the time to do this type of an analysis, they might get rid of that, that, uh, that deer in the headlights moment. You know, there are two moments of truth and a breach that people don't really talk about. The first is acknowledging or realizing when you've been attacked. That might sound counterintuitive. What do you mean when you're attacked? You can't get on. No, it doesn't work like that. It used to be where all the computers in the early days of ransomware, a lot of computers would suddenly have a skull and crossbones on top of the screen and be like, you've been hacked. Well, that doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes it's just that there's a latency now in the system. Or you see data going out in the middle of the night and, and you don't you, you can't track it, you don't know where it's going. And because the bad guys have learned to get really good at this. And so they when they insert the malware, they basically do surveillance. And in and the ransomware stuff has really evolved. It used to be where they delete your backups and encrypt your operating information, and then you were screwed. But now what they're saying is, let's not do that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around your network, your network and all your data. I'm going to find out what data you can't allow the regulators to see because you haven't encrypted it. Say you have a responsibility to encrypt it at rest and in transit, but you don't do that. Let's say you have stuff on your, on your network that shouldn't be there. That's maybe illegal. I'm going to reveal that unless you pay me. And, and, and in the last, the, the, the second moment of truth is when do you restore? When is it over? When can you go back? That is an incredibly complex analysis that talks about what data you were able to recover, when you, when can you, in fact, determine that the data is clean. You know, there are all sorts of strategies and then you, and only then do you recover. But your major point, you know, uh, do you pay the ransomware? So Suffolk County did not pay the ransomware. People were very uh, concerned back and forth. It was a, the, the, at the time the county executive was Steve Ballone. He was very clear. He said, I am not going to fund a illegal organization that could use the money for sex trafficking, terrorism, uh, you know, all, drug trafficking. I'm not going to do that. So we, yeah. we didn't do that. And that made the process much longer. But there's a, a, a hack that, that just happened a couple of weeks ago with an organization called Change Health. And it's a division of United Healthcare. And what happened there is it, it was an intermediary pay, uh, a claim paying organization that got taken down. And they paid the ransomware and they got a, a nasty note from the federal government saying, you know, we, it, we don't, we discourage people from paying because one, you don't know if they're still gonna be in your system. And, and two, that now encourages other people, you can make money on this. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. That helps. Yeah, yeah. They really struggled. They couldn't. Um, they 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 could really figure out under what circumstances they would decide to pay or not. And right. Every, you know, which was unusual because they had pretty much everything else locked up pretty tight. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that you can answer those questions in the context of an event like this. You know, get people in a room, talk it through. That's the kind of collaboration you referenced before. Do you yeah, pay? Don't you, you pay? Right. So. So what's the definition of a bad actor? <laughs> uh, that's in the chat. So uh, Black Cat, which is the organization that attacked Suffolk and also attacked this uh, Change Healthcare. Now that, that's a bad actor. And the definition itself, it's anybody, you know, you know the, the federal law is pretty clear about this. Anyone who accesses a computer device or a network without authorization is a bad actor. And just, just accessing it is the threshold for which you can say that's, that should not happen. Therefore, you are, uh, it could be criminal at that point. But the real problem is that what they do with your data and, and whether or not they deny you access to your data, whether or not they try to um, exploit the data, whether or not they try to sell the data on the dark web. Uh, these are all issues that depends upon what kind of strategy. And their strategy is going to be the maximum leverage for the maximum money. Any other questions? And well, yes, yeah, sorry. I got Go one. Ahead. So, Go so get, given that we have so many industries and there and, and there are different ages, stages of maturity, is it safe mm -hmm. to say that, that some industries get the value of privacy and security and risk management, and they will spend money on it because there are consequences, and other industries are clueless. So, for example, healthcare. The whole freaking system is clueless. HIPAA has been around for 25 years. 
And there have been about 50 fines for probably no more than a couple hundred million dollars over that 25 year period. Uh, it is easier, actually, I, do, I know one hospital in Tennessee that had a war chest and they would rather pay a fine if necessary than implement the requirements under HIPAA. <laughs> I guess that's the cost of doing business. That's always going to be part of the analysis, right? Is yep. it going to be more expensive to pay this and, and, and suffer this, or is it just easier to to um, to comply with what they want? But, you know, there, there's a, 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 a subtext to that. So if you go to the Library of Congress and you, tie, and you go and you try to take a look at a book that says, here are the standards for cybersecurity, you're not going to find it. it it's, it's kind of moving the goalpost because it depends upon the industry depends upon what you do. So the closest thing you have are a bunch of regulations. The Federal Trade Commission, HIPAA, th those are two examples. The SEC, those are all examples of regulatory requirements as to how you say that your agency, that your business is cyber secure. But the problem is that, you know, what are the teeth associated with that? So the FTC, for businesses, generally speaking, there are court cases in which the F FTC has basically said, You've held yourself out to do business, and yet you have not taken the steps to secure your cyber infrastructure. Therefore, that makes you liable under the FTC. And so they can have fines. Certainly with HIPAA, you're going to have fines as well. But to your point, yes, there, there are a lot of organizations who don't understand this. And what they risk is not just the data or the money. They risk people, people's confidence in doing business with them. That, that's the. I was just on a call this morning, completely unrelated to this. I, I serve in a, a, a pension fund, and we're talking about this this change healthcare breach. And I was, I, I, I'm the trustee, the manager, lead trustee on the on the fund. And I said, okay, let me be clear. We're not using this company again. We're going to migrate off of this completely. We're not going to go back. They may say that they're good. I'm telling you, we're not going to trust them. That's a part of the problem that everybody has to recognize. You can't guarantee that you're not going to get hacked. What you can guarantee is that you've thought through it and you have, you've got a good response plan that you've exercised. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Considering the integration of AI technologies into DR and BCP, what are the most effective strategies for leveraging AI, in your opinion, to enhance real-time decision-making and automate resilience processes while ensuring ethical considerations and data security are adequately addressed? Wow. That is an awesome question that probably requires another half day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so funny. So uh, on April 12th, the Attorney General of New York is hosting an AI summit, and she is going to be looking at that very question as to what are the ethical utilizations of AI in the space. I'm hosting one of her, one of her uh, sections on that. So but let's, let's talk about that uh, um, offline. Great. Monroe. All right. Monroe, uh, would take us out. Let me, uh, let me say thank you to everybody that took the time to come on this call today. So thanks for that. And Michael, I uh, just want to thank you for uh, taking your time to uh, school us a little bit on business security and continuity. So I hope uh, everybody on the call appreciated what you had to say. I want to say thank you to Arthur Colombino and his team for orchestrating and producing it. And, uh, you know, one last thing I heard this kind of recently, and I think it kind of pertains to what we're talking about here today, because I'm sure everybody in management has taken some serious steps to secure their organizations. But if you listen to the distinguished Mike Tyson, he said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So, you know, to your credit and exposing what could happen and preparing, you know, maybe when you do get punched in the face, you'll have a plan to get back up and continue to fight. So, you know, aside from that, Whatever we have planned, whatever we think we have as far as being secure, it never hurts to have another set of eyes take a look at either valid data to help find some holes. So I hope, you know, somebody, uh, people kind of think about that and, and entertain maybe bringing Michael and his team in to take a look at what you do have and 
maybe he could shore up your existing plans. But aside from that, thank you all. This was uh, great. And uh, the team that put this together, it didn't happen overnight. So thanks a million. And uh, hope everybody has a great and safe day and never gets hacked. Amen. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.